Hello, welcome to the France 24 interview. I'm François Picard. In an age where the internet, where 24-hour news channels like our own are revolutionizing the way we follow the big stories of our day, we're going to take a look back at uh, what was arguably perhaps the biggest news day of the last century. We're talking about uh, D-Day, uh, June the 6th, 1944, the Allied landing in Normandy. And we're talking about it with one of the men who helped bring it to life, John Morris. Welcome to the France 24 Thank interview. Uh, John, uh, you were photo editor for Life magazine at the time, and uh, you had under uh, your command, if it were, as, as it were, uh, six men, including uh, the famous Robert Kappa, uh, who took uh, those first pictures at, uh, at, at Omaha Beach. Um, you, uh, there's a photo uh, in the, your book, uh, Robert Kappa D-Day, which is a very nice book, a bilingual edition here by Point de Vue uh, Press. In the book, uh, you see a picture of the six of you uh, all, all together, um, six people to cover uh, yeah. the Allied landing. By today's standards, that seems huge, but then you gotta remember it was 80 kilometers of coastline they were invading. That's right, and there was more than one beach. <laughs> There was, the, there was a, a beach where the, the British, British and Canadians landed. Uh, the Americans had two beaches. Omaha Beach was the code name for one, and Utah Beach was the code name for the other. They were both, uh, Utah was further toward Cherbourg on the, on the Cotentin Peninsula. But uh, there, was, there was fighting there, but the great fighting that's been uh, shown on, uh, in, uh, for example, it was recreated for Steven Spielberg's great film called Saving Private Ryan. Uh, it was on Omaha Beach where there are thousands and thousands of casualties. It was very rough indeed. And uh, so that was one of the most crucial. And Robert Kappa was actually in the first wave. Robert Kappa, who had, uh, had to live up to his reputation as a great war photographer, which went, which went back to the Spanish Civil War, was expected to land in the first wave, and indeed he did. He was the only press photographer who landed in the first wave on Omaha Beach. Uh, Bob Landry of life landed on Utah Beach, but unfortunately, all the film, both Landry's and, and uh, newsreel people, their film was all lost when somebody, a courier, dropped, the, dropped it in the, in the English Channel on the way back to England. But so there's no there's no images of the very first uh, not landing U at Utah Beach. Not Utah Beach. No. You've 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 brought there. I see a, a picture of uh, one of the ones that Robert Kappa took. Yeah, this one. Yeah, tell us about it. Well, this is this is the, perhaps the most memorable of the eleven frames uh, that we saved from Robert Kappa's four rolls of film on the landing on Omaha Beach. Uh, I didn't get this film until Wednesday night. Um, D-Day had been t early Tuesday morning, and I was anxiously waiting in London all that time. Uh, finally, a, a courier came with, with a packet of film from Kappa and a message saying, John, all the action is in the, in the four rolls of 35 millimeter. We were under terrible deadline pressure because the whole world was waiting for pictures. We, in addition to because they have what was called a pool situation, where you right. were providing pictures for That's for correct. everyone else. We were in a pool with the three major wire services: Associated Press, United Press, and International. They all had representatives in London, uh, and they were they were as as anxious as I was, or perhaps more so. So from Tuesday afternoon to Wednesday night, you wait around the clock, right. you get the film developed, which takes a little while, and then you have to yeah. pass it by the censors. Yeah, exactly. The only picture that the world has seen up until that time was taken Tuesday night, around midnight, by a, an Acme photographer working for UP, uh, Bert Brandt, who had just barely gotten his feet wet and gone, gone immediately back to England, but it wasn't much of a picture. I, to, I can't even tell you what it looks like today. But Kappa had the reputation, and, and, and he, had to, he was stuck with it. So, Did he ever tell the, you afterwards about what it was like 
during that landing compared to, you say, I mean, you, we know of his pictures from the Spanish Civil War, but this is something that... He wrote a whole book about it called Slightly Out of Focus because when Life published his story, uh, the caption writer said that the pictures were slightly out of focus because they were blurry. Uh, they weren't so much uh, out of focus as that he was shooting in, in very poor light conditions. The weather was terrible. Uh, it was a wonder that we got any pictures at all. But uh, uh, when the, so when the film came in, I, I told the dark. We had a, I had a darkroom staff in London. It was, which waited for, around the clock for those had, pictures. Had, yeah, we'd been waiting ever since Tuesday morning. I had Larry Burroughs, who later became a very famous war photographer in Vietnam for life, was one of the darkroom crew that night. Uh, and anyway, so when, the, when that packet of film came, I, I said, I've got to have contact prints. I, have to, I had to edit from a, from, from a contact sheet. And uh, so as fast as possible. A few minutes later, and a, a darkroom lad came running to my office saying, John, the films are all ruined. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you were in such a hurry, I put them in the, in the, in the cabinet to dry, hung them in the cabinet, and, and closed the doors, and there was too much heat, and the emulsion ran. I said, oh my god. I ran back to the darkroom with him. And on the first three rolls I looked at, there was nothing. It was just pea soup. But on the fourth roll, there were 11 frames, and I, we printed every single one of them. They're all in that book you just showed. The, the, you then later went yourself uh, to Normandy uh, a, a, a month later and covered the, the rest of the war. When you yeah. think back at it, how tough an assignment was it? Well, <clears throat> I was not a photographer. I was a picture editor. Uh, uh, in a sense, I was the photographer's boss, but they didn't think of me as a boss. They thought of me as a colleague, which was fine with me. And when you were let going in, it's a different context from today. When, when there are wars, uh, we've seen recent conflicts, for instance, Iraq, even today's conflict in Libya. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's the international opinion. National opinion is divided. Here, uh, everyone was squarely against the Nazis. It was, was there this mm -hmm. feeling... Uh, what was the relationship like between the journalists on the one hand and the military on the other? There were about a thousand accredited correspondents doing one thing or another. I mean, tech, everything from technicians to in couriers to, to stars like uh, Edward R. Murrow was the star of the American radio person. Um, we were we were propagandists for victory. We wanted to win. We wanted to. Uh, and you felt comfortable with that. We we felt comfortable. We were glad to submit to, to censorship. It was it was a it was a headache to do it, but we but we submitted to that easily. Uh, today we're 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 fighting censorship, uh, and uh, uh, circumstances are different. Opinion is is more e divided about things like the situation in the Middle East, about the invasion of Iraq, which I personally oppose. Uh, I think it was one of the great mistakes of modern history to in invade Iraq. And the job of the job of photojournalist, when uh, we look, for instance, the recent uh, killing of Tim Hetherington and Chris Hondros, yeah. two great f photojournalists in uh, Libya, right. um, is it more dangerous, as dangerous as it was, less dangerous as when you were unfortunately, fighting them, Unfortunately, falling. it's gotten more dangerous for, for, for correspondents and reporters. Uh, the the um, journalists, working journalists, have become targets. Uh, in my day, uh, journalists were, thought they were immune from, from combat and that they were, thought they could be treated like medical personnel, you know. Uh, they would carry signs saying press, um, not that we did in Normandy, but anyway. It, it, but now journalists are singled out by, and uh, often shot in, uh, purposely. And they have less backup staff as they did in those days. Well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, One final question for you, John Morris. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the... Uh, the having to pass things past the censors and all that, but you also say that the job of a photojournalist is to tell the truth. Right. Today, right. with digital photography, 
Is it uh, easier to fudge the truth than it was then, or is it the same? It's easier, in some ways, it's easier to get the truth today because there are uh, uh, civilian people, ordinary people throughout the world have cameras now. Everybody's going around shooting pictures. Uh, you know, they, they have no quality and they're not professional pictures. And there's more, there's more need for good picture editors today than there ever was. But, there, but pictures, but the story does get out. It leaks out in various ways today. And that's, to me, that's a healthy sign. So I, I look forward, I don't, I, what is disturbing to me is the, is, uh, the, the problems of, the, of print media. I, I'm a print person. I've worked on television, but uh, Life, this was, by the way, this was the, the, the D-Day issue of Life. This cover of General Eisenhower had gone to press on the Saturday before D-Day, which was Tuesday, because the cover had to do, it, it took 10 days to print the covers. But the inside story, which is what we, what we produced, uh, and, the, and the, these pictures, are, are, these are, this is Kappa's pictures. And, and that was the lead story, and that was what I was sent to London to, to, to do. I arrived in London nine months ahead of time. <laughs> So today, time is not necessarily on the side of those trying to get the story out. I want to thank you, John Morris, uh, for, for being with us. And thank you for being with us here for the France 24 interview.